think about that? Yes, I'm surprised that um, there are still reservations and your, your uh, Native Americans are still contained on reservations. I, I just can't comprehend that. You know. We do have reservations and mm -hmm. uh, um, that's, that's a, it's, a good, it's a good statement. Uh, I just came back from one, as a matter of fact. Um, I was there last week where it was 100 degrees, but didn't feel like 85 degrees in Philly. It was in Arizona. And um, I, was telling, I was telling Bob um, that I, I felt so comfortable being there. Do you know what I mean? Everybody looked like me. Everybody talked like me. We all ate the same food. And, um, you know, I think that probably, um, I think that probably in your communities like that are an extremely positive thing. Although at one time they were very segregated and very, you know, it was a very hard, very hard thing to do, you know, live on the reservation. Some of them, many of them still are really hard to live. Um, it's, it's, it's a different form of education. It hurts, you know, some are good, some are not so good. Uh, tribal politics, I don't want to go there. Um, but mostly, you know, my relatives that still live on the reservation, I am a bit envious of. Why? They still speak the language fluently. They still know the ceremonies that have been a part of our people since the beginning of time. You know, they, they have a different perspective on, you know, on how we live away from the reservation. You know, a lot of times they say, why do you live there? How can you live there? You know, why don't you come home? You know, and going home is, it's just the best. You know, I, again, I was telling Bob last night that uh, some people at this conference said, well, you should feel really comfortable at this conference in Arizona. You should be, you should feel so comfortable because uh, these mountains behind us belong to you. And I said, oh, no, no. I said, I belong to those mountains. You know, I'm a part of those mountains, you know. But, um, and it's a different perspective, you know, of how, of how things are. Um, are they bad? I wish we didn't have them. You know, I wish we could say, well, that's just a part of, uh, of uh, it's, it's, it's where we live, you know. But they are there. And politics and government, they're difficult. Um, I can't say it's bad, though. You know what I mean, Bob? I can't say that it's a bad thing. I think it's, it's where I go to get my batteries recharged. You know what I mean? After driving in Philadelphia traffic, I think I need to go back. But um, uh, it's certainly a very positive thing for some. So, John, in your research, where have you found that these kinds of perceptions come from of American Indians? Is it the movies? Is it television? Where are we getting these images from? Well, the, um, the number one source, of course, is entertainment, either entertainment television or movies. You know, the most recent movies that are out with those kinds of images are the Twilight series, which are very popular, uh, and uh, the Avatar movie, you know, which is, you know, based on this kind of a space age dances with wolves, you know, and so... Uh, uh, not always seen as a positive thing with Native people, but those are where the images are coming from. And of course, millions of people go and see these movies or watch them on television, and, uh, and then, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the Indian frame of 18th century is, is seen and adopted and remembered. Hi, welcome to the program. Thank you. Your comment or question for John. I normally respect the privacy of individuals, but I'm now given an opportunity to ask this question. I do not have stereotypes or try not to, it's the way I was brought up, mm -hmm. but you are a baby boomer, that's how I can perceive you for one thing. Uh, how is your upbringing, I really don't know much about your upbringing, who brought you up, your influences, how you landed in, um, at the university, why you chose media, but if you could give us some of that, I think it would broaden the perspective of people uh, toward Native Americans. Your opportunities, those things that you found that kept you back, but you made your mm -hmm. way through. I'm hoping HBO makes a movie of that. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, 
honestly, uh, I think probably because of my parents. You know, my parents were uh, such strong proponents of education. And I went to school right after Brown versus Topeka Board. So it was hard. It was really hard to be one of the first dark faces in what were all white schools just a short time before. And um, I certainly had enough reasons to quit school, you know, and not go any further. Uh, but my parents, both my parents, uh, my mother and father, had only uh, gone to the eighth grade, my father, and then my mother had gone to, I think, about the same eighth or ninth grade. And then um, they couldn't go any further because of, of, frankly, because of being poor as church mice. I mean, they were very, very poor. Um, so when I went to school, uh, even though I had hard, extremely hard times in school, especially with my self-esteem, you know, I mean, I was different and I look different and I eat differently and I eat different kinds of food. And uh, people, I mean, children can be mean. I mean, children can be mean. And so, uh, but my parents, you know, my parents, my father especially, put the highest value on a high school diploma, you know, something that he would never own in his lifetime. And my mother did get her high school diploma just before she passed away, and it was a major step for her. And when I went to school, uh, I heard it every day. You're getting to do something that we weren't able to do. You know, we want you to be the first one to graduate from high school. And then I went to college, and they had no understanding of that. They just knew that people who they knew who were Caucasian, who had gone to college, were the people that drove the big cars and lived on the nice part of town and had picket fences around their houses. And they knew that if I went to school, you know, that, that those things should be easier for me to obtain. And, um, and I did. And I think I, I performed very well in school, if I can say that. Uh, because I wanted to do as I wanted to do the best job I could, not for me, you know, but for my parents. Hi, I'm Kiara Sauter, and my question has to deal with the names. Now, I know immigrants who've come to America, like most of their names are changed. Like my grandmom's name was changed from Figiolio to Flora, but I was just wondering if. Native Americans, if their names took more of a Spanish influence or in English, and I was just wondering, how do many keep their names or, yeah. <laughs> in 1878, the Dawes Act came out and Native people were required to, to move their names, you know, from, um, from like left no horses, you know, to another name. And many times that name was of the priest or the person, the minister or the missionary is probably the correct term. That was on, that was on their reservation or their community. You know, um, many times those missionaries had fathered a lot of the children. On the, so it's an ugly part of history. It's not, it's not pretty, you know, but... Uh, uh, I mean, that's, that's how it is. My name is a Spanish surname, and it comes from Peru, as did the Jesuit, you know, that was on our community. Hi, welcome to the program. Um, my question for you is based on a comment that you made earlier um, about how can American Indian uh, children and teens know their heritage when they're being taught by non-native teachers? So my question for you is, would you advocate a system that has primarily or exclusively native teachers teaching native students? We can't do it ourselves. You know what I mean? There's so few of us left. You know, I depend on, I depend on the teachers that teach my children to know something about Indian country. You know, to know something about who we are as a people, to know something about our history. Uh, and many times, and many times, um, our teachers don't. We need to know more about each other. Unfortunately, you know, we do not. Would I advocate a system? You know, in a perfect world, that would be wonderful <laughs> to have all Native teachers, teachers teach our children who they are as a people. Now, my children have grown up in uh, Columbus, Ohio, mostly. Columbus, Ohio, and Washington, D.C., and now 
State College, Pennsylvania. And I can tell you that there's not one American Indian teacher in the entire public school system at uh, State College, Pennsylvania. But I know most of the teachers in that s school system. I've made it a point, you know, to get to know those teachers. And so when my children go through their classes or other Native children go through the, those classes, they know something about our ceremony. They know why maybe we're fasting right now. You know, why they won't eat their lunch. It's not because they're angry. You know, it's because we're fasting. Maybe we're not in the Black Hills, you know, as part of what's going on there. But we're doing our part here in, in Pennsylvania. So um, I would advocate a system like that. I think it's impossible. You know, so I'm depending on, I have to. I'm depending on you to know who we are as a people and to know when something, especially when you're teaching children, when something is offensive and when something isn't. Uh, that, I mean, frankly, if you're a teacher, you spend more time with my children than I do every day. Hi, tell us your name and your question or comment for John. Hi, uh, my name is Lucy Williams, and I have a question about something that you mentioned earlier, and that is, um, you said that there's a very high percentage of Native Americans who are go to war for our country. And I wonder if you could explain that from your point of view and sort of unpack that. It's sort of complex in that there's this notion of the traditional warrior mm -hmm. for Native people, yet they're fighting for a country that has not treated them so well. And I also wonder, do many of those people come from um, those communities that are really below poverty level as a way to get out of those communities? Um, so I wonder if you could just explain this notion of warrior that you also see frequently in Native American literature and Native American art. I really wish I could give you a reason why so many of us volunteer for military service. I don't know. I really don't know. You know, many times people say it must be the warrior mentality or there's this new word I was talking to Bob about yesterday. I heard at a conference called blood memory, you know, that it's innate. It's inside of us. You know, we feel like we need to do something in a certain way. And... Um, you know, and I think, you know, that um, my, my perception would be is that after a certain period of time, we feel the need to serve, you know, serve us. We feel like we need to do something for the people. And standing up and becoming a warrior, whether it's a United States Marine, you know, or a warrior for the San Carlos Apache Nation. We feel like we have to do this. It's something, it's maybe a rite of passage kind of thing. And there's no animosity felt towards those that don't. You know, not at all. You know, some of us will and some of us won't. Um, but she actually touched on something, you know. A lot of the people that do volunteer for military service that are Native come from the most extreme impoverished areas of Indian country. Although it's not seen as a way out, do you know what I mean? A lot of times, you know, probably one of the most famous, um, you know, would be Ira Hayes, who was uh, Pima Tono Adam, you know, raised the flag at Iwo Jima, you know, and then went home, you know, went right back. He died there. Thank you so much, John. What an eye-opening conversation. We're going to take a short break now, and we want to tell you a little bit about what the Pennsylvania Humanities Council has been up to lately. It wasn't too long ago that PHC's Ann Benzel sat down with PCN's Brian Lockman to talk humanities. Ann Benzel, you are currently the chair of the Pennsylvania Humanities Council. What is the Pennsylvania Humanities Council? The Pennsylvania Humanities Council is a not-for-profit organization whose mission is to promote the humanities and cultural events throughout the state. What does that word mean, the humanities? Humanities has many different meanings to different people. But to me, uh, my definition would be the humanities are those elements or entities that touch us in special ways in our everyday lives. For me, uh, it's the arts, it's literature, it's history. The humanities are learning experiences that teach us